care, Tina. Let's go. Hi. This is my nose. This is Steve Gilmore. This is the Gilmore Gang. This is take two. Uh, after regrouping in order to give a green dot to be projected by a sniper onto my face. Uh, this is the Gilmore Gang. I'm uh, coming to you from uh, the offices of Betaworks in New York City. Uh, also in New York City is uh, the chief Borthwick person, uh, John Borthwick. Welcome, John. Hi, Steve. Thanks for being here, or thanks for letting us do the show from here. Uh, and back in California, uh, along with our producer and director, Tina Chase Gilmore, is uh, Robert Scoble. Welcome, Robert. Hey. Thanks. Thanks for having me on again. Uh, I hear you're not feeling too well. Yeah, I have the same cold that John has, so we'll be stippling in uh, unison. Excellent. And also in California, although he was here in New York yesterday, is John Toshak. Welcome, John. Thanks. I finally got over my cold after a couple months, and I'm completely healthy, so I'll be completely boring on the show. Okay, well then let's start with you. What else is going on? Chromebooks. I want to ask Robert about Chromebooks and glasses and the prices of Chromebooks, the Chrome Pixel and the Google Glasses. The, the reviewers of the Chromebook, so the Chromebook is a high resolution laptop that runs Google Chrome OS. So basically only has a web browser, doesn't do much else, which is a lot, you know, but it doesn't let you run uh, Android apps or, you know, Windows apps or anything like that. Um, I don't get it. I, you know, the reviewers like it. Um, they like the uh, resolution of it, but you can't I run just, Android apps, right? I just don't get it. There's so many choices now to, you know, buy a laptop with a, a web browser, whether it be a Windows 8 computer or a, um, a MacBook Air or a, you know, any, uh, any number of things. I, I don't know. It, it, it just seems to, for my $1,500, I'm spending it on the Google Glass because that actually brings something dramatically new and different and life-changing to me. Having a uh, yet another browser-based uh, laptop is like, meh. I'm sort of bored with it. Do you think companies would buy it because they could lock it down more easily? Yeah, than... there's, I'm sure there's lots of use cases where a lockdown browser-only computer makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, all the internet cafes in the world would love this thing, right? But um, I think telcos would not, resell it. I mean, it's I, just not something that's going to get what me they, hot What do they say about it when Google announced it? This gets me about as hot and bothered as the Sun Network computer, you know, back when, <laughs> you know, Scott McNeely was like, the network is the computer and we're all going to use uh, lightweight client, you know, based computers uh, that'll be hooked up to some server. And some of that did happen, and, but not in a real way on my, on my own desktop. I'm yeah. talking on an iPad mini. I'm doing video on an iPad mini. Yeah. So why do why, you need why, a don't, why do they keep going down this road with Chrome? Why don't they why? make Android, you know, Well, Chrome, Chrome. actually <laughs> makes a lot of sense. I mean, I'm staring into a Chrome browser right now, right? I, I love the fact that Google invests money in making that browser faster and more secure and, you know, simpler to use and all that. Um, I don't mind that at all. Uh, it's just, you know... This isn't going to be something that gets me hot and bothered. I am totally hot and bothered by the Google Glass, though. All right. Well, we'll get to that uh, shortly after the show is over. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, John Borthwick, what do you think? Uh, the Chromebook? Who cares? Yeah, I'm sort of uh, I'm with Robert on it. I mean, I, I barely noticed it. I didn't notice the first Chromebook and this one, the Pixel, um, I think is it's, it's another, another laptop. Who cares? Um, it's... I, I'm sure there's a use case somewhere for it, um, but it's, yeah, it, it, you know, why? Here's a question. I, I think the, the original that? Chrome, the, the original Chromebook, which is low cost, you know, normal pixels, I guess, you know, for that kind of notebook. Uh, I think if you're giving it, it away. A fairly decent second computer. I mean, it, you can take it anywhere. It weighs, you know, a pound or whatever. Battery life is really good. And you're running your you're running most of the applications used during the day, and most of the time you'll be connected. This one is fifteen hundred dollars, and the only thing I can see that it gets you is double the pixel quality of of a t of a high HD TV. 
And now I'm thinking, what, what is that going to be good for? It'll be good for watching, you know, maybe movies or something. But then you don't have that kind of enough bandwidth on an airplane. They, they, they usually block Netflix and things, you know, a lot of times. Um, and so there's just not enough to get you where you want to go with that device. Yeah, so I'm, I'm I really just, puzzled I mean, by I think it. Unless it's just a proof of concept, you well, know, that's if, Google's if, if, you know, saying they're going after something. Or it's a Microsoft conspiracy in order to make the surface look better. Right, for 1500 I can buy I can buy a top-of-line iPad, I can buy a top-of-line iPad mini, I can stick Velcro on the back of both of them, and so that they, uh, you know, I can slap them back-to-back, -back. I can carry a keyboard with me, and I could just spin Debbie. it around and use the one which, you know, which the, whichever form factor fits for whichever problem, so, and i probably save some money. So Go here's ahead, a question. Uh, which is more important, the Sony PlayStation 4 or the Google Chromebook? Uh, by the way, Kevin Costain is watching the show on a Chromebook, and he's saying that the battery life is mind-blowing, which shows some of the advantages when you do get rid of everything in the OS other than the browser. You, you're going to have fewer security problems. You're going to have uh, better performance overall, and you're going to use less battery life. But I mean, uh, I think that, Robert, aren't both of them, I mean, both of them are, um, are sort of niche computing devices, right? And so... A proprietary con one's one's an open, but very stripped down platform for web only browsing, right? The other one is a very proprietary, uh, closed platform for high end gaming, because I think the console business just continues to shrink. It's it's a business, but it's it's not what uh, it's not what it was. I think a lot of the uh, a lot of the gaming happens elsewhere. It happens on iPads. It happens on iPhones, and it happens um, on the open on the open platform. So I think that they're just two sort of edge computing devices. They're, it, they're a piece of the puzzle because I think the puzzle is a multi-system, multi-form factor, you know, puzzle. But they're just small pieces of the puzzle. I'm more interested in like this week. I got my, you know, I got my Pebble watch, right? Yeah. And I'm more interested in that, right? Because that is a, uh, it gets closer to the ambient sort of, you know, part of part of what I wear and part of, uh, you know, my my actual um, uh, sort of normal experiences of living as a, as a human being. Computing's entering that, and that's the perfect bridge for you to talk about Google well, Glass. Th so steel. What do you get out of this Pebble Watch? <laughs> what do I get I have, out of it? I have it? no interest in wearing something, an accessory on on myself on my arm. So, yeah. so John, what? So I've had it for 24 hours. So I'm just getting to use, used to it. So I think it's an interesting. It's a, clearly a V1 product, but what it's doing now is that. So it's it Bluetooths to my phone, right? And what I have here is I have a set of apps, uh, and right now the apps are fairly limited. But when a text comes in. Um, it comes down to my Pebble Watch, right? So if Steve sends me a text, um, it will eventually just pop up on my watch. Now, I can't respond on the watch, but it's basically a notification layer for text. A phone call comes in. I can navigate. You know, there's a little app here that lets me navigate music, so I can turn on here, and I can just... <laughs> Turn, turn on music on my phone if I want to, so I could use it almost like a remote control. Um, now I see I, the use case. It's, for, it's, a, it's a meeting saver. You're actually in a meeting instead of having to, you know, get the <coughs> notification on your iPhone and actually take your eyes away from it. Right. You know, it's yeah, like Blackberry it's, first, then the iPhone. It's for so meetings. It's, it, you it can could just also kind be of for, glance uh, at your watch and see what's going on. And John, I don't know why you can't hear us talking at the same time. I, it seems like everybody else can hear us. But um, the, the watch is another display surface for your phone. It's useful for, uh, you know, if you're uh, skiing, for instance, you don't want to pull your phone out of your jacket because you might drop it on the ski lift. And But if somebody's calling you on a Bluetooth headphone, you can see who's calling you just by looking at your watch. There's something there, you know, but I think, I think, I mean, I, I have a basis watch. I have a, a bunch of the Pebble prototypes that they made, you know, when they were at Y Combinator. And I just don't, I agree with you. I just don't wear things on my wrist that often and it feels uncomfortable. The glass on it, the other hand, is going to be on my face all the time. I, I'm never going to take those things off. So, so do you have your glasses yet, Robert? No, I've worn them, I, 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 but they haven't given them out yet. They're letting journalists like uh, Joshua Topolsky at uh, The Verge got to Verge, wear them yeah. for a couple of hours. And I'm, I'm still not sure that he, he has a pair, but... Um, clearly, they're starting to hi hype up the uh, Google Glass, and so I, I would expect in the next month that uh, the, the early adopters are going to get them. Yeah. 
but similar to Google. I'm not talking about it. What's that? I'm not going to say a word about it. I mean, uh, I think Google Glasses are, uh, you know, uh, overpriced, under. Yeah, you don't know what the price is going to be. <laughs> right now, it's an R&D project that's turning into a, a early beta project, and you won't know the price until October. That's that's when consumers are going to get them. The you know the early adopters will pay any price to have them. But, you know. But I think that I I think that you know the the parallel with the pebble and and granted the pebble's just a very it's a first instance and it's uh and it's also a small freaking company compared to Google. But you know both of them are trying to build a platform, and so you know I'm intrigued to see what simple apps come out of the pebble or come into the pebble, and and the Google guys are obviously working very cl uh, closely with a bunch of developers. Um, to get the initial app set there, because I think it's all going to be about the apps, as as, as it always is, right? And well, so I think it's gonna. I think it's gonna all be about push notification stream, and I think that that's uh, what Pebble, uh, you know, signals is the idea that the notification stream is the platform, and that everything will proceed from that outward to the rest of the devices that you consume. So on that. On that level, Google Glasses will be a similar device. Yeah, except the Google Glass does other things like capture pictures and photos. And, and also, because the Google Glass is on your face, the sensors are always in the same spot. And therefore, it can do things contextually uh, that a watch can't do. For instance, it will know which direction I'm facing. It'll know whether I, when I'm walking through a, a shopping mall, whether I stopped and looked at a store, because uh, that'll be a very different behavior. And, and a watch or something in your pocket just cannot do that. Um, and Ludwig asked, do I plan to wear these glasses all the time? Yeah, I, I plan to wear them except for when I'm sleeping. Uh, do, can you get uh, your prescriptions in them? I mean, how, do, how does that work? Not the first how version. Are they, how are they selling them and distributing them? No, well, that, the, like I said, there's, they're not. Uh, you know, we're going to find that out later this year when they actually sell them to consumers. Right now, they have 2,000 or 3,000 sold uh, through the Google I.O. conference where they, they said, hey, anybody who wants to buy them, it has to buy them today, and they're $1,500. And I was one of the 3,000 people that bought a pair. Um, and now they're having a contest to let other people into this uh, $1,500 price point. But this is a, a pre-production run of these Google Glasses. I would expect when they're on the, on the shelf uh, in October or November that they're going to be $500. Because uh, the Oakley ski goggles with the heads-up display is $650. And I think Google's going to be very aggressive about the pricing on these things. They want normal people to be able to you know, at least have a shot at it. Fifteen hundred dollars is way too high a price. It won't succeed at fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah, I mean, normal prescription glasses can run anywhere from a couple hundred to a couple thousand dollars when you get yeah. all the lenses and coatings and everything. Anyway, but so, but the Pebble intersection with the iWatch, if that actually exists, is is interesting. So then you have an ecosystem and you have a notification system, and it's still a watch. Is anyone interested in the iWatch? Yeah, because the the iWatch is going to be a piece of jewelry, even if it doesn't do anything, you know. And it'll sell just because it's a piece of Apple jewelry. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, but you know, if you look at the basis watch that I'm wearing right now, mine's recharging, so I don't have it on. Uh, it does heart rate monitoring and and tells me how many steps I've done, how many calories I'm burning, my sleep pattern, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's similar to the Nike Fuel Band, the Fitbit. Uh, the Jawbone app. I talked to Mark Andreessen this week, and he invested in, in Jawbone. And he says Jawbone has a whole range of wearable devices coming out. Um, and so, you know, Apple will fit into that space, only it'll be the sexiest of all of them. The basis watch I have is particularly ugly. It is, it is the anti-jewelry, you know. Uh, wearing it makes you look like a nerd. Um, you know, and the Google Glasses are somewhat in between. You know, it's sort of sort of cool, but it's sort of nerdy. Uh, Joshua talks about that that people would look at them a little strange. You know, um, all right. So, so, so it'll be interesting you. to see. All right, uh, John Borthwick, uh, I understand why you got the the Pebble for you know it's a Kickstarter project, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, honestly. 
Tell me why it's exciting to you. Uh, so a couple of things is, first of all, is that I think that it's starting, you're starting to see this sort of proliferation of an ecosystem of devices that sit around the phone, right? And so the phone from a power, a power management standpoint and Bluetooth are now good enough that you can have sort of this constellation of devices around the phone. And, um, you know, I think that this is a good example of that. So that excites me. Secondly is the notification stuff excites me a lot, right? Is that I think that having sort of fine-tuned ways to be able to get notifications off the phone, um, as Robert said, you know, if your phone, your phone, my phone is, it's with me all the time, but it's usually most of the time it's not in front of me, right? So it's like having something which is right in front of you and, you know, I'm comfortable wearing a wristwatch uh, and or, or Nike fuel band or something on on my wrist. I think that the, I mean, Robert's point about fashion, I think, is actually the Apple point is a really important one because I think the the Pebble is, um, it's they, they've there's some nice design elements, but I think it it's it's not a nicely designed product. It looks like, you know, something that fell out of the Jetsons, and so I think it it's. Uh, you know, figuring out how to make all this stuff truly wearable and part of our lives is a huge piece of the puzzle. And I think that, um, uh, you know, the pebble is a long way to go on that. But the notification stuff I'm really intrigued with because that is, uh, if that's the primary interface of navigation, um, you know, sort of the, the way that I'm going to, you know, find what I'm going to go to then it's an important, uh, it's a really important um, as, as piece of the computing infrastructure of the future. That's why I like my Pebble. Okay. Well, that's why I like my Pebble. That's why I'm intrigued with it, right? So, uh, you know, basically the, the uh, iWatch is dismissed as a fashion accessory. But what do you think, uh, Robert, what do you think Apple's strategy is around this? Uh, it isn't just to sell, uh, it, you know, fashion. It's There's a reason why they want to do this. Well, it, you know, if you look at what Apple has, right, they have the best retail chain in the business, and they cha sell more per square foot than any other retail store. And so things that are small that would have a high... Uh, uh, buying rate w are attracted to them. And so selling a, a watch makes a lot of sense just from that standpoint. Um, even if they only sell it to 10% of the people who have iPhones or iPads, that's still a lot of watches. And these things are probably going to have margins of 30% and they're, they're going to turn over very, very quickly and, and take a lot of uh, very small inventory space. So all of those things make uh, the business people at Apple hot and bothered. But I think... What the I uber think, strategy what you know what well, i think we're deeper we're heading into an age of context where if you know more about me you will be able to build better products than your competitors and i am still not seeing how apple plays in this world of context particularly when google is out there doing a public r d project <laughs> called this google glass where they're wearing them in public and interacting with people and asking them what they would use these things for and seeing how accurate their maps are or their, if they look at a building or look at something, how accurate they could make that or how accurate they could make the samples uh, for understanding are, are you running or skiing or walking or jogging or riding a bike or shopping or riding a bus. The more that they do that kind of stuff, the more uh, innovative and more forward-thinking these companies are going to appear. Google, to me, is way in the lead right now, and it's, I really am struggling to see how Apple catches up. Okay, I think so Apple's kind of uh, become a hardware supply chain management company with a lot of design, and there's, there's, there are many more things, you know, their whole ecosystem operating system, but there's this one part of them that's this hardware part and um, and if you are thinking in terms of patents, which they do, and uh, locking up the patents on really small design, really careful engineering, and the supply chain around how things get smaller, you know, when you make a watch and you have to get that real, you know, things really uh, small in order to make things better, even on the bigger devices. There's an interesting angle there that they have where they're going to have a focus on all the designers, you know, going after this, and they're making money on it too. 
besides the you know the other you know what you said is like eighty percent of the of the answer. I think there's another part of the answer which is a hidden one, which is that is that supply chain lockup. Well, it's supply chain. They have the ability to. That's why I call it jewelry. They have the ability to build something really elegant. If I was at Nike and on the fuel band team, I'd really be worried about Apple's entry into this space because uh, Nike right now owns th this wearable uh, health monitor space, right? That you, uh, monitors your activity. And this watch, this Apple watch will do the same thing. And it'll do it in a very sexy way with a very uh, flexible, if you, if you believe the patent uh, application that Apple has. It's a very uh, flexible screen and it'll do all sorts of stuff when it's on your wrist versus on a table or something like that. So it, it's going to be something I buy. It's just not going to be something, I don't think it's going to be as significant a product as the Google Glass. The Google Glass is actually going to change my life m far more than anything on my wrist. But I, you know, there's going to be a lot of geek jewelry coming out. Um, and already has come out. I mean, I've seen people with Nike field bands at at every conference now, right? Geek jewelry. It's it's, it's <laughs> geek jewelry. It's it, the Nike field band. A lot of people who wear it say, "I just bought it for the watch," you know, and being able to tell time and just to signal that I'm a part of the the geek community, you know, and I'm trying to be healthier, I guess. Um, you know, and that's why I like the basis watch. It tells me about, you know, my workouts and my walking. And I, I have this app on my iPhone called Moves, which does the same thing, right? It tells me um, what, what my activity was, and it sort of urges me to do more, you know. Well, yesterday I didn't walk that much. Let's, let's look. Yesterday I did 0.6 miles, right? And it, so it urges you to, to do a little bit more walking, and it, and it starts showing you context, right? So it starts showing you, hey, you're walking or driving. Um, and that soon will turn into an, app, a, an OS level thing that applications then can sit on top and say, whenever this happens, fire an event and do a notification or do something on the screen or, or uh, you know, bring an ad to a, to a display or uh, do all sorts of fun stuff, right? Well, I, I want to uh, make a comment about, uh, I think that what John Toshek says about uh, uh, supply chain lockup is, is a significant part of the story. And I think, Robert, you just sort of agreed with him by suggesting that uh, this is a pattern that we're seeing with a lot of uh, companies where you, you, know, you go into Starbucks for coffee and now they're upselling you to records and then they're upselling you uh, to sandwiches and you know by the end of the day uh, every store is going to carry one of everything designed to basically while they've got you in their environment basically take the money out of your wallet uh, or, or your electronic wallet and uh, dedicate it toward you know their revenue stream so I think that uh, you know, and obviously the supply chain lockup in terms of uh, uh, Apple's ability to be able to produce something that's more elegant and uh, uh, you know cheaper than anybody else can because they've locked up uh, relationships with uh, their suppliers uh, through their volume. I think that's a significant part of the strategy. But I, I also think that there's uh, a, d a difference between uh, the sexiness, the geekiness of what Google is doing uh, and the success in the marketplace. And further than that, I think that there's also a difference between uh, success in the marketplace and the behavior that it incentivizes, which then transforms the market. Yeah. So uh, I, I think that it's an overstatement to assume that because Google is going after the bleeding edge that it necessarily is moving the needle uh, or that, that uh, to put it in the negative, that Apple is only after, uh, uh, you know, a, a sense of, uh, of uh, geek chic. Uh, I, I don't think that's the case. I think that Apple is about uh, the after effects of the marketplace. John uh, Borthwick, what do you think about that? about what I said. So, so I, I agree with most, uh, with most of what you said, Steve. I think that the, um, 
I, I think there's a piece of the puzzle here which is moving sort of beyond the supply chain, which um, which is the data aspects of, of how these businesses evolve. I think that Google understands uh, Google is a data is a data company and understands how to use and apply data uh, at scale to, uh, to to these problems. And I think Apple is um, is by no means a data company today. And I think they're going to have to learn how to become a data company because when you think about the example of the of the wristwatch or even the glasses or any of these wearable things, is that it's uh, you know, a large piece of the problem is about filtering, is about algorithms, is about understanding context, is about processing context, and is about building you know, in, insanely great applications that do all of that. And I think that uh, you know Apple's applications um, on iOS, I think, are falling behind. Uh, and you know, in 2012, I replaced most of the defaults with with something else. Many of them with Google um, replacements. And I think that Apple uh, is is got to understand and figure out how it becomes a data company, because I think that the uh, it, it, you know relegating yourself to controlling supply chain, um, I think on hardware is um, is not ultimately going to be where most of the value is. But I, are you so sure that? Uh... You know, just because you know, I mean they're doing this in the iOS and fr uh, framework, so uh, I mean the data is flowing through both systems. It's it's not the either or. I mean they're but getting Steve, all the data. Uh, I think that they're getting that get, data before Google gets it. Right, but you know AOL got a lot of data before um, before most people got it, right? Because AOL, you know, way back was you know the largest ISP in the country, and you know f saw data on the entire internet and the emergence of the entire internet, AOL didn't know what to do with that. And it wasn't designed and created as a data-driven company. And uh, yeah, I think that if you think about you know, Yahoo, for example, one of their big challenges, I think, is tr to become truly a data-driven company. I think that there's few companies who are designed that way. Google is. And I think that um, it's, uh, you know, it, it is, it, it's a core difference between uh, the DNA of Google um, and between them and between Apple and, and, and quite a few of these companies. Anybody else? Yeah, I'm just pulling up the video that was released yesterday of Google Glass and what it looks like, you know, in your eye. Um, I, I think Google is about to turn a major corner where they are going to start being seen as an Apple-like company, a design-centric company, a company that's uh, not just about blue underlined links anymore, and a company that's uh, really trying to do breakthrough products. And that's uh, that space that Apple used to own and almost own wholly. And it's uh, really great to see some other companies jumping up and trying trying to take the ring that, uh, or take the void that Steve Jobs left when he left us. Yeah, but I think that uh, if you grant that Google is beginning to look like Apple, uh, why can't you grant that Apple is beginning to look like Google? It's just, it seems like there's, well, Google, there's the Apple fanboyism wants in both directions here that you're discounting. I, I agree with you that... that Apple has aspirations of looking like Google, but Apple's maps absolutely sucks in in San Francisco. I've used it several times more this week. It is continuing to bring me wrong places. It, the, the, the software that Apple is building and the data-centric services that it's trying to compete with are nowhere near the quality of what Google has done. Maybe so, it's kind of a, a Zen thing. It's bringing you where you really should be going. Yeah, I, you know, I, no. Um, I, I'm always <laughs> going to use best of breed. The reason I've been an Apple fanboy for the last six years is it has been the best product in the market, and I can I could have clearly argued that, and I can still clearly argue that today. But this Google Glass and the data centric services that Google is building are far beyond anything Apple is using. I'm not using Apple email. I'm not using Apple context. I'm not using Apple calendar. I'm not using uh, Apple maps. I'm using Google on all those things because Google is dramatically better in all of those systems, even with the flaws that Google still has, you know, particularly in context. 
So I, you know, I just don't see, I don't see that Tim Cook is the right guy for the job. Boy, Tim and Cook then, is and not then, a software guy. He's not a social guy. He doesn't understand how to beat Facebook. He doesn't understand how to work with Facebook. He, he doesn't even understand how to talk Mark Zuckerberg's language. And his company culture was built by a guy who wants to be secret. And they are going to struggle in this new age where openness is going to matter. John? Which John? Me, John? Either one. Either one. So I, I think that um, I was thinking about some of the other companies because it's kind of remarkable. You know, I mean, the zero is down to a Google Apple discussion fairly quickly. And I think that um, the, I think that um, it's, it is so interesting to talk about Google right now because since Page took the helm, I think that they've, they've uh, transformed uh, a piece of that company. They're still not, they still don't have social products, right? So there's huge gaps there. Um, but I think that the design DNA that they brought into the company or, and uh, is, it's fairly remarkable how quickly they've done that. Um, I think on the social side, there's huge flanks that are open at Google still. Um, I think that they've uh, they, they failed on uh, almost all all the social stuff they've pushed out. And did you did you see uh, um, Sergey was joking around with Mark Zuckerberg yesterday um, about Google Glass, and and Sergey admitted to him that he's not an expert on social networks. <laughs> yeah. And I I think that's. Uh, a little bit of humility, but it's it's absolutely true. Yeah, and I think so. So I think that the, I think the die is by no means set, but I think it is worth talking about Google um, because they've they've they come a long, long way in, um, in a short in a short time. I think the other players are just gonna, you know, how does how does how do these social platforms, um, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Pinterest play in this world? Um, or are they just apps in this world? Um, or can they find a broader reach? You know, Facebook certainly has to. I don't know if the others need to, but they certainly should well, aspire to. There is a tie. Steve Lee, who's the product manager for Google Glass, is an investor on Highlight. And Highlight is hooked in with Facebook. So he, obviously, Steve Lee sees, oh, with these glasses on, we're going to want to know things about people coming cl closer to us or photos of things, people that are close to us. And the, Highlight just announced a new f photo feature that's pretty cool and will be very hot at, for instance, South by Southwest. Um, and, but think about the glass with Highlight and then Highlight's hooked into Facebook, not into Google uh, Google's social c circles. So right. um, it'll be interesting to see what how open these glasses really are. I, I, unfortunately, I missed the first hackathon and they're, all the developers are under NDA, so they're not allowed to talk. But soon we're going to hear a lot more about that developer story. I don't think they're going to have a story unless they open, make it open. And the, whatever content comes from glasses can be uh, used by new innov innovative platforms. Yeah, it was um, really, I mean, you know, that's, go that's going to be the, the key for the success. If you yeah, go back to the original dem the original demos of Glass, right? The check-in was proprietary Google check-in. It was not Foursquare. It was certainly not Facebook check-in. Uh, the social stuff was all Google Plus, right? So, um, you know, th that's John. That's exactly the right question. And I think they've got to they have to make this stuff open. It's a, it's interesting that you know you said that uh, you know Sergey and Larry uh, they were uh, they they're very good at risk taking and, and they're they've really advanced Google, you know, well beyond people's expectations. And that's reflected in the stock price today, I think, you know, if it's, you know, probably gone up a couple hundred bucks over the last couple eighteen months or so. Um, I'm not watching it that closely, but I noticed that it peaked over eight hundred at some point last week. Um, but they haven't really shored up the things that they should be. <laughs> um, Docs is still Docs, and now Microsoft has come back in with you know whatever version of Office runs in the cloud now. I forget which one, and um, and the, it, but the, it does. It runs in the cloud. They've uh, the email is now they they've changed Hotmail into Outlook dot com. You know they're, so they're going to try to get some. They're going to have they're going to have an actual attack on Gmail now, and uh, that they've never done before because they never you know thought it was important. 
But, you know, they haven't changed those things. They've changed the infrastructure, right. but they haven't changed what it, the, the appeal to the users, and they need to. That's an that's important part of uh, Google's future success. Yeah, I think that those are flanks that open, and even, you know, on the app side, I mean, it's like you can't sit still. It's like the innovation cycles are in incredibly fast right now and you know so on the app side I mean I started using the mailbox app um, uh, which I love and I've always been as, as I, I've I do GTD stuff, so getting things done stuff. So inbox zero is kind of the way that I work. So it works well for me. Um, but it was like a huge sigh of relief to see an app like that. And it takes email to a very different place. And now, you know, I'm not going back. I, I want a desktop app that does the same thing. And I want an iPad app that does the same thing. So I think yeah, you can't say Apple's any better at this. I mean, Pages is kind of terrible, and <laughs> the uh, um, the uh, the Apple email client is terrible, and the calendar yeah. is terrible. <laughs> yeah. I guess it's, it's just maybe it's hard, harder to do than you think, even though it seems to be that it's it should be fairly easy. Maybe yeah. it's just something that everyone concentrates on. In the on. past two weeks, we've gotten a dramatically better mailbox client with Mailbox. And we've gotten a dramatically better calendar uh, uh, client with uh, Tempo from SRI. And so here again is ex an example of how Apple is not innovating and Apple's not spending its cash. Why isn't Apple going and buying these companies like Steve Jobs? Remember, Steve Jobs bought Siri within two weeks of its release. And why isn't Tim Cook doing that? Because he's not an innovator. He doesn't get the urgency of locking these things up before they go somewhere else and they will go somewhere else i guarantee you that steve yeah i'm 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 absorbing this on my ipad mini which i couldn't be happier with so uh, you know i think we're living in two separate worlds here yeah but steve I, I think the tale of steve jobs you know foresight um, is is what we're living through, and I think that. Um, it's... Wait, how can you say that? I mean, he. I mean, uh, he was known for uh, uh, using misdirection on some things. He said that, that nobody wanted a seven-inch tablet. Right. So, he said so nobody at, wanted. At what a, point? I, I bought phone, right? Yeah. And, nobody... and nobody wanted a phone that played videos. Right. Yeah. So this isn't a seven-inch device. It's a seven-point-nine-inch device. And uh, and those extra uh, millimeters actually make a big difference. Uh, the you know the Apple environment continues to expand rather than contract. In spite of the you know I mean I'm not trying to uh, be uh, I am trying to be blunt about what I think about what Robert is saying about Tim Cook. I I think that. Uh, you exert power uh, through d different mechanisms. And I think he's doing an extremely effective job of uh, exerting power through the mechanism that he is talented at. Whether or not that's ultimately going to be perceived as uh, a weakness and a failure uh, because of his, uh, uh, according to Robert, and I'm paraphrasing obviously, um, you know, not recognizing the speed with which Apple has to act in terms of acquisitions. I just, you know, I don't, I don't know that that's either accurate or will turn out to be true. That doesn't mean that I, I don't understand what Robert is suggesting. Go ahead, John. So I think that, I mean, look, if you take the previous cycle of computing and you say, you know, the shift from the desktop to the laptop is that, you know, many of the, uh, once the laptop sort of form factor was in place, an incredible amount of value came from supply chain management, right? And so I think if you assume that the tablet, uh, the iPad, and the iPhone are just the form factor and that's it, then you say, okay, it's going to be, you know, for quite a while, it's going to be an Apple-centric world. But I think that what you're already seeing is you're seeing this sort of morass of other devices, this proliferation of other devices, sort of pushing against those things. Some of them hang off those things. Some of them supplant those things. I'm not talking about the Chromebook, right? I'm talking about these, the, the other stuff we've been talking about. And I think Apple, that... Et cetera. 
and um, what that means is, is that the 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 sort of the core sort of you know of what your company needs to be right now is not perfecting supply chain it is that's a piece of the puzzle an incredibly important piece of the puzzle but it's about innovation it's about product driven and product centric user centric um, so the development it's about software it's about understanding the cloud it's about data and I think that uh, and it's about social and I think that on a bunch of those fronts uh, it's hard to see where Apple uh, has uh, has strength well, well uh, Apple's going to be profitable for a long time to come no matter what I, as, just as like, Microsoft right just, just like Microsoft but we're not talking about Microsoft as an innovative company creative company world-changing company anymore we're talking about it as oh it's Microsoft and they're still selling a lot because you know people still need to be compatible with what they used 10 years ago that's Look, not exciting it, to a Gilmore game just, it's just you know there's a difference between what's exciting to the Gilmore gang and what the insight of the Gilmore gang is and all I'm suggesting is is that just because it is absolutely true what you say about Google does not mean that it's true what you say about Apple they're now, just they're separate. I think Apple has still. Apple was a very special company for the last decade. It, it was a company that we hadn't seen in maybe a hundred years. That it it brought um, innovative, interesting, world changing products to us almost every year, and we're having to deal with Apple is not going to be that. You know, Apple is going to come out with a uh, Retina iPad. And it will sell a shitload because people like you and me will buy one. Even though I'm a, a switching some of my allegiance over to Android, I'll still buy one because I still, I'm staring into $10,000 worth of Apple stuff here. I, and I like Apple stuff generally. The supply chain is important. But it's not, it, it's not making me dream. That new I, iPad Look, is not like making me dream about wanna... a future. And I... it used, Apple used to make me dream, right? Well, uh... All I'm trying to say is, is that when you get to, to be successful, at that point, you, the, the things that you find important change. Yeah, you, you know, when you get to be successful, you start relaxing a bit. Um, I, don't, I don't see them relaxing. I, think I do. I, I do, well, and I, I understand I'm hearing you. over I, and I'm over. I'm trying to make this into an I was just in Mark between... Andreessen's office this week, and I'm hearing it over and over and over. For, I was on a tablet panel with a bunch of analysts. They're saying this, that Apple is relaxing and slowing uh, down. I, I, there's, there's no dearth of people saying what you're saying. I'm just disagreeing with you, Robert. I, I understand I, that. Okay, so what I'm so is, so is a watch innovative. I went to the I went to the oldest place in New York. It's not, but uh, just for the example, which is Grand Central Terminal, yeah, or station. I, I don't think they call it terminal anymore. And it's terminal. It still is. It, guess what? Yeah, guess what? It's an Apple store. Yeah, the whole building has become an Apple store. Yeah, I went in to try and get my iPad Mini keyboard extension you know which uh, evidently mg Siegler has the only copy of them i think you're wearing the apple glasses when you saw that <laughs> what you mean the rose-colored apple glasses is that what you're saying yeah the ones with the green dot that shine in your eyes oh yes <laughs> now that was that's google glasses they know they're not going to get it on my head so they're going to come in through the window so the I was trying to find this thing, and they said, oh, that's accessories. And I said, well, where's accessories? And they pointed across the terminal to this room. You could see it sort of shimmering in the distance. And you go over there. It takes like five minutes to get to the, to the accessories department. I mean, this is a global platform that is not contracting, is about to move into television. It's expanding rapidly. And well, that Apple store was a brilliant move, and that you know that was like ten years ago. So Steve, and, let's, and it, let's, it was quite amazing. I, I admit, but that was ten years ago. Okay, yes, go ahead, John. So I was just going to say, let's talk about something which I think we can agree on. Is I think the Apple guys will do something in TV in the next six months, and so uh, what does everybody think it is? I mean, I think that it's going to. I think it's a cable-ready box um, that they ship. Um, we've 
so that you could throw away your cable box. And but how, how do they get that into? Uh, is it cable ready or is it uh, uh, cord cutter ready? I think that they do a deal that like that they did with AT and T with the cable guys, um, because I think that's. I think there's a path there, and it's a part of Apple's DNA to. to you know, they're more of a closed company. So I think they go down that path. I would, I, I would hope, I would like to see a uh, cord cutting play, but I think that they've already kind of got their cord cutting play, which is Apple TV box, which I have one um, and I like it, but it's, it is, it doesn't give access to a lot of the content that people want, right? And so instead of waiting that out, I think that they jump in with a box, not, not a TV um, this year. Has anybody noticed that they seem to have uh, absorbed Netflix as a, uh, like a, you know, uh, a partner? I was reading something, uh, some official Apple document, and it talks about, uh, set, oh, I know what it was. It was setting up the, uh, some device. Oh, it was setting up an Apple TV, and it talks about Netflix as, well, there's this, this, and this, and then get your Netflix account. Are you being attacked by zombies? <laughs> there aren't zombies. Go ahead, Robert. I don't know. You know, I don't know where to go with the Netflix stuff. I, you know, I, I like Netflix. Uh, I've, I've watched the uh, House of Cards app, uh, House of Cards show on it, and. Uh, you know, that would be a great acquisition for Apple to make, buy all that infrastructure and, and buy into uh, old movies. Um, why, buy, why buy it when, they, you know, when they're, it's already feeding into their architecture? Um, because they need more levers to get more content people at the table. When, all they need is a few levers on this content plays, uh, and everybody is going to have to get and sit down and, and negotiate with Apple. Right now, they're resisting Apple because they saw what Apple did to the music industry, and they don't, want it, they don't want it to happen to them, so they're all resisting partnering. I think that's why this TV hasn't happened yet. I, I mean, it should have happened a year ago, but... Right, so, but I think what John, John is suggesting, uh, uh, if he's not, I am, is, is that what they, they've, they're absorbing uh, their so-called competitors. Uh, you know, Facebook uh, on the iPad works better than any other of those products, including Twitter or Google+. Plus. It, the, the, it's stunning, not only on the native app, but also on the hybrid app. Uh, we're using HTML5. It, it's really getting acceptable to be able to push out stuff through the, you know, you can Facebook share or you can Twitter share. They're an equal parity. So, you know, you may say that they don't get social, they they got the two social players basically uh, wrapped up into a into an individual layer. Same thing with with, with Netflix. I yeah, mean, but that's different than getting it culturally as a company and figuring out how to how to do something with social themselves and and really how to take it for, forward and and you know and do something innovative and different. I well, had you know, if the use... world is the way the world is, it's, yeah, it's the... okay. Apple's going to make a shitload of money, like I said. It's just not interesting to me. I, I, it's not interesting to me the way Microsoft's not interesting to me. I, Microsoft makes boatloads of cash. It could, they still continue to make boatloads of cash. It's just not interesting to me. Microsoft I, would give their eye teeth to be in the position that Apple's in. And, and uh, I... You know, I remember being in a meeting where Bomber, somebody asked Bomber about Apple back in 2006, and, and his answer was, oh, I wish I was, uh, I wish I was Microsoft, actually, was his yeah, answer. That's still his answer, but you know it doesn't really read very well. Certainly not with anybody. No, who back then that Microsoft, Microsoft was the big to... boy. This, you know, this world can change pretty quickly. I, you know, this entire world changed in six years. For Microsoft, it's going to change quickly. Come on, it sure did. Six no, years ago, Microsoft now, was, was now, dramatically now. bigger than Apple. I'm not talking about six years ago. I'm well, asking. I, oh yeah, I, I watch this industry and it changes. And right is now we're Microsoft, going through a change. You think Microsoft is going to get into this game quickly? No. no, I didn't say that. I said Apple is going to be disrupted by other players who know more about me. 
You've already said that they have been disrupted. I'm, uh, no, they're going to continue being disrupted until they get an innovator at the top. I, I think that's a, uh, I don't think you're right. Uh, well, John, uh, you were about to say something? Tim Cook came out of the supply chain. He has not done anything innovative in his life. He has not brought a new product to the market that's a brand new product. He has done innovation on your iPad. Kudos. He made the iPad thinner and smaller. Great. But he has not done what Steve Jobs did, which is bring a dramatically new product to the market that makes us all go, whoa. And when he does that, then I'll believe. But I, so far, he has not and will not, according to people inside Apple, outside Apple, around Apple. And, and I see that Google is doing this. So right now, my attention is moving from the people who are not innovating anymore to the people who are innovating. Yeah, I understand your point. You've been making it for quite a long time. I, I made this point six years ago when the iPhone first came out. Everybody's like, oh, uh, Nokia can make a better phone camera. Okay. I, I don't think that just because... Nokia has the market share. Nokia is on top of the world. This little biggie company can't do anything. And I told them they were wrong because that's innovative. It's more usable. This Google Glass is innovative. It brings something new to my life that changes my life. Apple has not done that in how many years since the first iPad came out? It's like, you know, since the Big Bang, there hasn't been another Big Bang. Okay. And there's another Big Bang coming. That's what I'm trying to say. On your forehead? I don't think so. Uh, it's not just forehead. It's <laughs> technology that's going to sweep through all pieces of all industries who knows more about me is going to we'll matter see. deeply and we'll apple see. doesn't know anything about me their maps suck their social data okay. goes to all facebook right. this is you're you're repeating yourself and so am i so uh john borthwick you wanted to talk about tv where do you think it's going to go because i'm not hearing anything about tv coming out of the google glasses and if it does it's going to not be able to register your heartbeat because you won't have one because you won't ever move. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, no. Um, so, gosh, there's a lot there. So I violently agree with what Robert was saying about, um, about Apple and about innovation and about what's happening at Google and elsewhere. And I think whether it's coming from small companies or whether it's coming from Apple, uh, from from Google, I think that there's there's so much more to build here, and I think the point, well, the way that I think about it is, is that the device, you know, use the analogy of the Big Bang, Steve, but the device architecture is not set yet, right? And so, it's you you can't like revert to supply chain management as your sort of competitive edge here. You've got to be focused on products and on building new devices and on new software for any of these endpoints for everything that we do and touch and whether that's cars, watches, eyeglasses, everything. So on TV, I, I actually disagree um, with um, with the way, Robert, with the way you set it up. And I'll go through this quickly. I do have to head, head out shortly. But um, I think that if, if Apple bought Netflix, I think it would set the whole TV thing back. And the reason is, is I think that the content guys need to have, um, that they need to see a competitive market for or at least a set of possible alternatives, even if it's not highly competitive. If there's four or five or two or three good alternatives for them to sell content to, they will continue to begin to open up that pipe. But if it all reverts into Apple, if they acquired Netflix tomorrow, then I think that it would, you know, the, the windows that are starting to collapse would, you know, they would even slow down. And so, yeah, I think that the, the, the whole content landscape is still, it's, it's very complicated. I think that there's, um, you know, the... Um, hey, John. Go, yeah. Uh, just, can I just interrupt one second? Cause can you make a parallel with uh, AOL, Time Warner, and content and a distribution network? Because that's AOL had distribution, and uh, obviously <laughs> right. the web, and they also had uh, the, the non-web. And they had Time Warner, which was right. content. What what happened there? Why didn't that work out? Well, I mean, I think that the you know the assumption was is that a you marry a content company with a distribution pipe, and then you you're you're going to figure it out how to you know 
get that get the content down that distribution pipe. I think that the AOL was a distribution pipe that sat over narrowband. It itself did not have a broadband architecture, so I think AOL got its distribution pipe got cut by broadband. And then I think that this this architecture of managing content of, of marrying content and con conduit is is a very fragile architecture. And I think that if you go into a period where you're going to be confident that you can control the pipe for 10, 20 years, like with cable, then you can marry those two things together. But I think if you're going into a multi-device, multi-pipe world, which is the one we're in, then marrying those things is fraught with danger because you really don't understand or, or know which are the endpoints which people are going to you know, consume on, right? And so you you can't like you you can't decide which is the endpoint up front. You can't like lock in that architecture. So anyway, <coughs> so I think the content stuff is still very much open. Um, I think that there's um, there's a lot to be there's a lot to be done there. And I loved House of Cards. And I gotta go. Thanks, John. Pleasure, Steve. He's right over my shoulder. <coughs> Let's watch him leave. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, John Toshek, what your response? Yeah, I think that's uh, that's probably right. I think think is also a political and a DNA issue too. AOL. Um, had a false distribution mechanism. It was, uh, I just I shouldn't say that. It was actually a very real one, which is you know sending out two million CDs, but they didn't have any context of who was using it and why, and uh, and they never measured it, so they never had the data around it. So all they had, although they have a, a distribution mechanism, it was kind of more along the lines of an elaborate postal mail distribution mechanism. And uh, Time Warner certainly had content, but the content they that they tended to own. Uh, tended to be um, historical or publications, and they did this right around the same time that the pub publications were being disrupted by the web. And I think the hope was that they could combine them and they benefit based on it, but actually they brought each other down a little bit. And, uh, you know, and, and there was a board seat issue with uh, who was in control. That could have probably salvaged it a little bit. I think AOL was really expensive at the time. And uh, they got peer things. I don't know. Steve Case, he's, you know, he's usually uh, you know, pretty active on these threads. He, he has a lot of ideas around what, what happened. Um, so what is but I think those, each today? of those companies would have been stronger without each other. Um, as far as the parallel with um, – is somebody trying to talk? Because I know I can't hear anybody when I'm talking. Yeah, yeah. What's the analogy with today? The analogy today is that Apple is not like that at all, really. Um, Apple is mostly a platform for uh, developer-led content, and not and creative content is a, is done through the other distribution channels that they have. And that, now they do have music, and they do have you know there's uh, there's parts of it. But you know I think most people consume you know uh, Netflix or Kindle on on an iPad, or through any of the you know thousands of applications that are content consumption. I think content is changing it, you know, just generally away from a lot of things. Um, so I think they're in actually a pretty good position. They're certainly in a better position than Google with Play because Play is almost like the Time Warner example. They don't really know they have a large distribution, but they don't know have the, they don't really have the data yet. So now they're going out and collecting this data. That's why it's that's really interesting to, to Robert and to uh, John and I, and probably you. Um, the um, the uh, the other one would be Amazon has a distribution, but they're going to. I think they're going to get so big that they're going to run into political baggage. I mean, they're just they're just so uh, immense in, in terms of what they what you can get on Amazon, and they don't seem to have in their DNA you know, the the distribution mechanism for movies. Although I really like Amazon Prime and the and the you know, watching cloud videos and things like that. I just don't. They need to align better with a company like Google. Um, so I don't know. It's a it's a, it's a, a Apple's thing to lose um, as a platform because they get a cut of the data, uh, a cut of the money. The problem is that they don't have the real data and they don't know what to do with it. And 
and that maybe they do know what to do with it, and maybe they're hiring all sorts of business analysts and you know and, you know quant guys to to crunch the data. It just doesn't seem like it yet. And so if there's a surprise that comes out this year, that would be it. That they know, uh, they know what to do. They know what to re recommend. They know what people are doing, and they put that context together in something that's consumable by a large audience. Well, my my sense is, uh, I agree with everything you said, except that uh, I'm uh, the part where I agreed with you. But uh, the thing that I think is going on with uh, uh, with very Apple, new, in a very nuanced sense of irony. Yes, thanks, Mose. Uh, I uh, I think that that we would do ourselves a disservice. Uh, to ignore uh, Apple's ability to be able to essentially partner with the startup community. Uh, it's not a traditional way. It isn't the acquisition route that Robert's talking about. Uh, but effectively, uh, the innovations that are starting to occur uh, outside of Google I mean, effectively, the startup community is not competing with Apple. They're competing with Google. And Apple is sort of aligning with them by providing a platform where they can make money. This is what we're seeing in the publishing business. We're seeing, uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, the, the major magazines are abandoning print uh, for the most part, and they're moving to the iPad. Uh, secondarily, they're moving to... Uh, the Nexus 7, but, you know, the prescription, the subscription I have to a, uh, I don't know what it is, uh, Esquire or what? Vanity Fair, uh, you have Vanity on your Nexus, Fair, right. but I think Kindle has a really good platform for, for that. I, I agree. I think that, the, I don't think it's a zero-sum game, but what I don't see is Google, uh, you know, enveloping uh, that startup community. I think that people... Uh, we had a conversation last week about some sort of uh, tool, which uh, you pointed out, I believe, uh, was already being, uh, 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 oh, it was uh, our conversation with the Kinetics folks about uh, their new uh, square tag uh, uh, environment. And, uh, and you pointed out that Google, what was it called? Uh, Google Goggles uh, is already doing this. So uh, I wonder at what point uh, that we will start to see Google as, uh, you know, essentially uh, marginalizing the startup community in their uh, in their rush to try and own big data. Robert? I think they're going to empower it if they if they play it right. And Goggles is one of the is uh, is that announced yet, Robert? In a yeah, second. it came out so, this week. I mean, I, that's an example of an app, a third-party developer that can only build on Android or Google and can't build on uh, on Apple. I was at Flipboard yesterday. They're building for Android and Apple at the same time, and I'm hearing that more and more. Runkeeper told me they're, they're going Android first and then iOS second because the user numbers are starting to shift. But so what, I'm, I'm talking about, what I'm talking about is, uh, I'm asking you, Robert, what, what about uh, you know startups when they – think about trying to get somewhere with their products, who are they competing against? They're not competing against Apple. They're competing against Google. Google takes um, th these ideas and folds them into their overall services, and that company is gone unless they're we, acquired. We haven't seen that. Uh, we're, uh, we haven't seen that in a big way yet. I, I, I disagree with you. I'm not... You know, I haven't seen uh, Google do a run keeper. I, even on Maps, right? Google hasn't taken the Waze ideas and put them in the Google Maps yet. They've, they've sort of tried at the edges, but not in a frontal way. They haven't been able to really compete with Facebook head on. Um, what other, you know, there's a million apps. Uh, you're telling me out of those million apps, uh, how many have been copied by Google and put into Google? I'm not, I'm not telling you anything. I was asking you whether you think that there's, uh, that if you're a software developer uh, and you're trying to, uh, you know, in a startup and you're trying to get some traction, uh, how do you view Google? Do you view them as a partner? I don't think so. I, I, I a lot of people do. I mean, 
you know, Google I.O. sold out in 18 minutes. So there's a lot of uh, developer uh, developer activity right. on Google, just like there is right. on Apple. I don't think you can point to Google being any better than Apple, other than Apple has the better customers at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. Apple does have more of the influencers. Apple does have more of the people who spend money online. Apple does have more of the users who use mobile more and use apps more. Will that change? I think it is starting to. I, you know, I, I, I'm seeing lots of influencers who are switching to Android. Mark Zuckerberg, by the way, three weeks ago told me I love that iPhone. Uh, yesterday I heard he's switched and he's now using a, a Samsung Galaxy Note and he's really excited by it, which he didn't expect to be. He thought it was too big. But, you know, I, we're going to see shifts a little bit, but I, I don't see one killing it for developers where the other isn't. I mean, Apple is ahead, but not noticeably anymore. Yeah. Okay. Uh, John, you were saying something? Well, the only John left. So uh, the uh, uh, you know there's there's always a there's always a um, a really really good chance that when you write for a, on a platform, especially a popular platform, that they eventually are going to be your competitors are going to be your partners, and the you know your your point of platform can be a competitor too. Um, you know, meaning Apple or Google could be your competitor at some point, but but that's uh, the DNA of Google is really uh, uh, kind of like this real time analysis and, and search page rank. You know the uh, the algorithms. It's an algorithms company, and um, and so that enables developers to develop interesting applications that Google will probably have no interest in because the more that they attract this kind of developer. That is developing more algorithms. The more that they get, the more data they get to, in order to mine, and that's not a that's a, actually a really healthy ecosystem. It's not like the Microsoft ecosystem, where if you had an interesting thing, Microsoft would acquire it because it's a source of revenue, right? Because Microsoft is a licensing company, and they want to license that. Google is a mining company, and they don't. They can just they'll mine the data. The more that it it, it spreads throughout the world. I. You know, I think they're changing from that. I, you know, I think you're misreading the signals out of out, out of Google. Are you talking to me? Yeah. You were that just is not an algorithm company. It, it, it certainly it has. Been. I've been the biggest Google component I think it's, for the, I think for the it's longest time. I, I think it's an out. It, their heart is algorithms. I think it's and it, and I think it, 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 and I said a long time ago that it's easier to, to it's easier to design on your algorithms than. And create great products, which is why I've been an Android user for a long time, and um, and it's a uh, I don't think I'm misreading this at all. I think this is a, a a way that Google has an advantage over every other ecosystem. Okay, but you can't uh, when you're talking, you can't hear. So he was trying to say something. Go ahead, Robert. No, I, I was just saying that they made a corner turn, and you know the the design that I'm seeing them do in product design and user interface design. Is quite different than they used to be. Uh, it used to be I, a I company agree. That, that didn't like design at all. You know, uh, how many develop designers have left Google and say, "Man, all they care about is blue underlined links and doing A/B testing and not doing anything breakthrough or innovative." I that is not the company that exists today. So something has changed at Google, and I, I say kudos to them. This is uh, they learned a little bit from Apple or from Steve Jobs or whoever, and. Uh, I'm excited by their products. I, I'm not excited anymore about what I'm seeing from other players in the market. You know, and, and by the way, I'm watching across the web. You should see how, many, how much play this Google Glass video that came out yesterday is getting and how much play the, the Joshua Topolsky interview over on The Verge got and is getting. It's at the top of tech meme right now. So there's interest in innovation. And I think that's where Gilmore Gang has always been, you know. Gilmore Gang has always been about Office is dead. It's not dead, but it's dead in terms of innovation. There's nothing new in Office. Even well, I it, just tried Office 360 online. It's a piece of shit. Yeah, right? well, guess what? Guess what? You know, uh, I agree with you, but I'm not going to be saying Apple is dead. You may want to, but I'm not going to no, say No, I'm it. not saying they're going to be. I, I never saw Microsoft was dead. I thought that was sort of funny catch line you had. Mike, the Office is not dead. 
you know, they make more profit than any other company other than Apple does, you know, off their two products still today. Well, even after they have it, they don't have to develop tech, anything. They can resell it. It's a licensing company. Exactly. All they have to do is move it online, and I'm, people like me are going to sign up for fifty dollars a month because I need to write a book on it. And it, it, you know, it really is not that innovative. You know, it's not like uh, Microsoft Connect or a Apple's iPhone or Google Glass. Those are the kinds of products that get us hot and bothered on the Gilmore Gang. You know. Um, well, I, you know, uh, are you gonna, you, Steve? Are we gonna get hot and bothered by having a new Retina display on our iPad Mini? Really? I am. I no, I, I I'm saying you're gonna buy if one. But are, are we really gonna go and go? Oh my God, that is the biggest breakthrough I've ever seen. No, I already have Retina screens on my iPad and my iPhone and my MacBook Pro. It's not a breakthrough. It's not. It's not a life changer. It makes my eyes e easier. Okay, great. It's it is a life changer. Uh, it is ah. changing my life. Uh, ah. I look. I've got this little green dot on my nose now. I didn't have that before. <laughs> Dude, I, you know you've lost it. I have not lost it. You've lost it. If, if you think the retina Get display on an iPad is going to be mind blowing and gr groundbreaking and life changing, I'm telling you. And, and I'm is, telling you. I'm telling is, you. The iPad Mini is the single most disruptive thing that's going on right now, in my no, opinion. You no can way. say different. No I, I understand where you're coming from. I don't think you understand where I'm coming from. I, I get it, you know, but we've switched roles, which is ironic. <laughs> Masters of irony. Yes. Okay, let's wrap this one up. Uh, Robert? Uh, let's start with uh, Tasha. I can't talk now because my phone's ringing. Okay, it stopped. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know. I think it's going leaps. I mean, it, things aren't uh, iterative in, uh, in, in, when it comes to design. And they, they tend to be uh, more Big Bang or just, you know, giant... Uh, Giant steps, and I think uh, you know we're just waiting for what Apple's going to come out with, and uh, and and Robert said they are secret. You know we have we don't see it, we don't know what's going to come out, but it doesn't mean we can't be surprised. I just highly doubt it will be this year that anything comes out that's going to be act, actually shocking, and and this this era of transparency is really interesting because Google is is uh, is they've been talking about the glasses. You know that would be that would be a veiled or a complete sealed secret from everybody in every other company, because it was so it would be you know you just didn't do that before, and they're really pushing this on you know on this on the use case, which is developing a, a huge uh, you know kind of a positive sentiment around around it and what what are what are going to be do what are people going to do, which attracts developers, and I think that's an interesting thing. I you know. I, I would I I think last year I would have said no I don't want it but now I do I want I want Google Glasses I want to be, take a picture with my eyes I want to see context I want to see you know, what you know what what are things it's just like when I go on Google now or uh, I want to see what's going on I want to have some context around things it's a great idea I agree Robert? with Robert but I I disagree with Robert on him saying that that Google's not an algorithm company that has now has design I think that's the two things that they have. And they're good at both, and they're sandwiching the competition. Robert, um, I don't know how to wrap this one up. I, I, um, I'm just not hearing good signals from Apple. And um, I, I, as part of my frustration is, uh, you know, they they built such an expectation that every year would be something. Uh, fairly mind blowing. I I just am not hot and bothered by an iPad uh, Mini with Retina display. I, I that's not making me a uh, dream. And um, you know it'll be nice, but it it's not making me dream. Um, so I'm looking for for who's going to fill that void. You know who's going to make us dream and and push the industry way forward. Um, you know, it, it, for me, it, Google's approach is winning right now. And and um, I don't see how Apple is going to win. You you guys keep thinking there's a TV system coming out from Apple. I I just don't I don't see that they're going to be able to disrupt that industry the way that we want them to. And 
if they do, um, I, I'll be the first in line to buy one. But I just don't hear those kinds of signals coming from Apple right now. Well, all right. Uh, so just to respond to the uh, the TV thing, I think that there's an ecosystem uh, emerging uh, around AirPlay, which is going to be transformative. Uh, it's going to be they're going to be there first. It's not going to be Google. It's going to be Apple. Uh, it, they are in partnership, whether they uh, effectively are or virtually are with Netflix, with uh, you know this binge viewing kind of model with all sorts of, uh, 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 you know, signs that we're seeing of the transcendence of the PC era into this new mobile, small device era and how, how we navigate through uh, uh, an ecosystem, which you guys have already pointed out is well underway, uh, whether it's glasses or wristwatches or, other peripheral devices, the interplay of that uh, is uh, is more than I had anticipated that we were going to get to a lot faster than I anticipated that we were going to get there. So uh, I've got plenty of excitement. I, I see Google Glasses as one entrant in, in a much larger story. And, uh, you know, I expect that when at the end of the day that the Google Glasses are going to be uh, uh, acquired because of their network, not because of the design qualities of the device. Because you know, ultimately, it is a fail in terms of its ability to be able to. Uh, you know, right now it's a very very large device. It needs a lot more processor power and battery technology than is going to make that accessible, uh, you know, anytime soon. But it's not like Bill Gates' battery problems. It's, it's going to happen within the next year, year and a half. But it's going to happen not just for Google, but also for uh, Apple. Uh, and then there's one other thing, which, you know, there's a lot that we can talk about on this show. The things that we can't talk about on this show, or at least we can only sort of infer them are the things uh, you know that we are working on uh, at, at the company that I work for that John also works for. There's a lot of innovation in this industry uh, that we can only uh, talk about uh, in terms of how it's reflected in the uh, um, in the rearview mirror of other companies who are seeing something gaining on them and may or may not be in a position to be able to do something. So there's a tremendous amount of innovation that's going to occur on top of the Apple platform and on top of the Google platform. And I think that's what, what we have to look for. So uh, I, my only concern about uh, the so-called argument between Scoble and I is, is that we're in violent agreement. Uh, it's just uh, you know, we don't have the tools yet to be able to point to in terms of uh, of why these devices and the behaviors that result from these devices are important. To me, that's what's exciting. That's what I dream about are the behaviors, the incentive for people to use these tools and transform their lives in new uh, and disruptive ways. And I think that's going, and I don't think that Steve Jobs' uh, legacy is even remotely close to being uh, exhausted. So that's how I feel about it. I, wa I want to thank uh, our producer and director, Tina Chase Gilmore, for uh, holding this down uh, uh, from California. I want to thank John Borthwick uh, and uh, the Betaworks team for hosting us here in New York. I want to thank uh, Robert Scoble very much for being uh, as obnoxious about uh, Google Glasses as he possibly can be. <laughs> <laughs> and this, of course, is just a commercial for your book. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you can end up with AirPlay and uh, I, iCloud, which is bringing me photos of my kids and other things. Exactly. Oh, there's, there's Danny Sullivan at the uh, Facebook uh, launch right there. Ha, 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 ha.
Excellent. I want to thank uh, John Toshek. Uh, uh, I'll, uh, I'll be seeing you online, I guess, for the next few. There's going to be a Salesforce event uh, on the 26th, which I believe is being uh, webcast on uh, uh, Salesforce Live with uh, Mark Benioff. So tune into that. That's why I'm here in New York still. And uh, I want to thank Rackspace and particularly Rob Jess for their support for turning this show uh, and getting it back on the air, where I hope it's, uh, it continues. I want to thank uh, New Tech and their TriCaster. I want to, again, thank the people in the chat room who, because of the last second uh, scenario where I tried to get my MacBook Pro to work but on the network and it didn't, so an, yet another trip to New York carrying not only the MacBook Pro, but also uh, my uh, Retina display big uh, iPad, uh, none of which I, I ever end up using. I'm doing this show on the iPad mini and it's working great. So uh, thanks to everybody who showed up and especially those uh, who will show up once they get the new Retina iPad mini. We'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.